So hi everyone, welcome to the Marley Meyerson JCC Manhattan. And you are here tonight, oh no, hold on. You are here tonight uh, for a wonderful talk called Fiber, the Anti-Inflammatory Diet for Robust Health and Resilience with Dr. David Deneoff. Um, fiber and water are the keys to a healthy diet. Learn why a fiber-rich diet is an essential ingredient for a healthy microbiome biome and how fiber prevents inflammation and is key to optimizing our health and longevity. Hear the latest research on how fiber-rich foods can help combat chronic disease including obesity, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and autoimmune conditions. We'll discuss practical ways to improve your metabolism with an evidence-based whole food plant-based diet. And there will be time, um, of course, set aside for Q&A. And I want to let you know that, in case you didn't, that this is being co-sponsored tonight by Plant Powered Metro New York. Um, and we're thrilled to be here. So Caroline Colas, take it away. Thank you so much, Wit. I'm going to um, welcome Dr. Deneef to the call. And um, what just love, I'm going to add you on here, and just love to, for you to tell us in your own words, a little bit about your background and why you became a doc, because I think it's a great story. Sure, I'll just take a few minutes if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I um, became a doctor. Um, I was diagnosed when I was a child uh, congenitally with cerebral palsy. And uh, I was told that uh, I wouldn't be able to cut my own meat. I wouldn't be able to horseback ride. I wouldn't be able to do all the things everybody uh, else would, and I would also need a rhizotomy, which meant cutting the um, yeah. cauda quanai or horsetail of my spine, and they also wanted to cut my right Achilles tendon. So that would have been great, so I wouldn't have had spasticity, but I also wouldn't be walking today. Mm -hmm. And so this inspired me to say, okay, I want to be at least average. I want to be an average person. I want to get up to the ability so that when I run, I don't fall on my face every three steps I take. And so this really motivated me through life. And I had a really wonderful doctor from the Hospital for Special Surgery named Dr. Root, ironically, because we're going to talk about root causes. Um, and Dr. Root believed that I could do this through lifestyle changes. Now, he didn't talk to me about um, diet. He talked to me about exercise and about how I could strengthen it and what I could do. And I spent a lot of time doing that. And I went to this uh, hospital every three months, every six months, and so on and so on. So it inspired me to want to help other people. And so I um, became a doctor. And But even more than that, I wanted to help people in a way that I was helped. So this idea of lifestyle medicine was very exciting to me, especially since I thought I could help people the way Dr. Root helped me, but even better. And so I did a fellow, I went to Stony Brook Medical School and then did my residency at University of Maryland in internal medicine. So um, I'm a practicing doctor. Um, and then um, I did a fellowship with Dr. Joel Furman, the person who wrote Eat to Live, the best selling book about a uh, whole food plant based diet. And then I uh, started, and I did a study with him and we published a study in diabetes that was really impressive. And then I started my own practice and I've been in practice for 10 years. I have two practices, one in Brooklyn Heights, what I call, if you're in Manhattan or you're not in Brooklyn, I call it Manhattan Plus because it's one stop into Brooklyn. Um, so it's right next to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and there are seven different subways, which is what makes it a really awesome place to live. Um, but I also have a practice on Long Island in Setauket, which is right next to Stony Brook, where I went to medical school. Um, and I've, in the 10 years, I've written over 250 articles for the layman press. And I've also just recently um, had two articles, um, two actually studies published in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine on um, on a whole food plant-based diet and its impact on inflammation. And so that's why we're focusing on inflammation and fiber and the whole food aspect. So I'm just sort of tying that all in to uh, what I've done. And also I see every patient for an hour 
And in the last 10 years, my computer has told me I've seen over 15,000 one-on-one, one one hour appointments. And according to Malcolm Gladwell from The Tipping Point, if you've done 10,000 hours, you're an expert. So I must be an expert plus because I have 50% I have fifty more time with patients, but almost no doctor spends an hour with a patient. Yeah. So having said that, um, do you mind if I do a very quick... Yeah, but just let me tell you one thing. I think that you're not only a doctor, you're an inspiration. And I know you have some opening remarks. Do you want to... I'll pop off for a moment and I'll let you, st you start. How does that sound? Sure, sure, sure. Um, okay. And I always say to patients, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, but uh, so um, what I'm going to talk about is a whole food plant-based diet and the importance of it and how it relates to fiber and inflammation. But what's really important is that we hear this term plant-based diet all the time. We hear plant-based foods and we've got to make sure that it's not unhealthy plant-based foods, but that it's whole food plant-based diet because unhealthy plant-based foods consist of a lot of processed foods. Just because you're eating plant-based foods doesn't mean you're doing a good job eating healthy foods. So you want to focus on that whole food part of it. And the whole food part of it includes beans and legumes, nuts and seeds, vegetables, especially dark green leafy vegetables, what I call DGLVs, fruits, and whole grains. And this is what we really want to focus on because this is where we get the fiber. This is where we get the anti-inflammatory effect. This is where we get the paradigm shift in medicine. So when we say lifestyle medicine, it's really very interesting because there's less emphasis on medicine and more emphasis on uh, lifestyle. And the reason for that is in conventional medicine, we can treat diseases, but we can't prevent and reverse diseases. And lifestyle actually can do both. They, well, they can do all three, but they can reverse disease and they can prevent disease. And that is a tremendous thing at the same time as treating disease. Whereas we don't have medications that actually reverse disease. The best we can do right now is potentially reduce the risk of a disease or help slow the progression. But lifestyle really changes that and brings that paradigm shift to the forefront. And this is very, very exciting. So diseases such as diabetes, cholesterol, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart disease, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, um, arthritis that many people have, even obesity, which is considered a disease. And the reason obesity is considered a disease is it's not just the body weight. Body weight's not important. It's the excess fat. You want to look at excess fat, and excess fat has what's called adipokines, which are cell communicators between fat cells that create inflammation. So it's not just the weight, it's the actual inflammation created by excess fat. So that's what I thought we'd start off with and uh, give sort of a introduction to. And then we can talk about fiber and what the benefits are and how to reduce inflammation. Um, so uh, Caroline? Yeah, sounds great. Um, thank you so much. And, and again, it's wonderful to have an expert to chat about this with. Uh, I was doing a presentation last week and we were on Don't Mess With Stress and she coined the term inflammaging. Have you heard of that? I thought it was fascinating because what she was essentially saying, and it's in reinforcing what you were just saying, which is that aging is um, acerbated by inflammation. Right. Aging is exacerbated by inflammation. And in fact, if you want longevity, the lower your inflammation is, the better off it is. And the scary part about inflammation is not about acute inflammation that we all need to fight off infection and to fight off um, injury and things like that. We need those. It's the chronic inflammation. But what type of symptoms do you get when you have inflammation with the acute or the infection? Can I answer that? Is that okay? But, yeah, well, what I thought we'd start with is just what is inflammation? And, and how and why does it occur? And it's kind of a little bit of where you're going, which is like, 
how and when is it beneficial to us and how and when does it work against us? Sure, absolutely. So inflammation is when the body uh, experiences something that it thinks is harmful, whether it's bacteria, whether it's an injury, even stress, emotional stress or physical stress can cause inflammation. So it's not just um, an injury or an infection, but you can cause inflammation from a number of sources. I have a patient who did snow plowing for 48 hours without sleeping and then ended up with tremendous inflammation and actually ended up with shingles because of the inflammation. So I wanna just give an idea. So it's basically when the body thinks there's something harmful, it starts kicking in the immune system. When it kicks in the immune system, you get all these symptoms. So the way to think about it is, imagine what the flu is like. The flu is where you get uh, swollen joints, where you're uh, painful, your muscles hurt, you feel fatigued, you get a headache, you might feel na uh, nausea and vomiting, you don't feel like eating. So all of these, your eyes may burn, you may have all these symptoms of sore throat, all these symptoms are basically not the flu, but they're the reaction to the flu. They're the reaction with your body or your immune system kicking in. Hmm. So you were essentially saying, uh, Dr. Deneyev, that different systems in our body, like our circulatory system or our um, respiratory system, experience inflammation in a different way? Right, right. So you end up with shortness of breath, you can end up with inflammation where it's painful. You can end up with swollen joints because of the circulatory system. And all of these things are affected in different ways. Wow, that's really interesting. And is it is it kind of like, I, I've always thought of like inflammation, like if, if we hurt a, a muscle or something, it's like the five alarm fires, all the fire trucks go to the site. And sometimes that can get really confusing because things swell or they, uh, is it an overreaction of, by the body or is it, is it something that is really necessary? Well, that's a really good question. And it's a really, you have to put it into context. It depends on what your baseline is. So if your immune system is already controlled and you've reduced the inflammation and you also help control your white blood cells, which are the type of cells that are involved with the immune system, and there are m multiple subsets of those. Um, if you control those and keep them at the lowest levels that are effective, then you won't have as much response. You won't have an over response. So let me give you just an example because we're in this current COVID-19. Has anyone heard of COVID-19? <laughs> yes. So in COVID-19, we have the person gets potentially infected and they end up with a virus. But the problem isn't necessarily the infection, it's the response by the immune system. So the immune system may overkick, it may get overzealous. So in other words, if you have a white blood cell range is anywhere from, let's just say, uh, let's just call it four to 11, okay? The white blood cells, and when I say four to 11, that's 4,000 to 11,000. So four to 11, we'll call it. If you have white blood cells at baseline that are around eight or nine or six, six to eight is typical, then when you get an infection like COVID-19, you're more likely to go up by threefold. So that would mean you're more likely to go 18, 24,000, 25,000. That's where the immune system goes very high. That's like sending in the whole army to fight the battle. Whereas if you have a white blood cell around three, four, even below the range, which is great, around three, four, five, your number is only going to go up maybe threefold, but it's going to go up maybe to 10 or 11. And so you're going to get more of a targeted response. It's like sending in a SEAL team to get that one response that you want, and then you're not going to get an overzealous response. So what happens in COVID-19 is that people when they get severe COVID-19 and they're hospitalized, they might get what's called, I'm sure everybody's heard of this by now because the media has done a really good job of scaring the crap out of us, the cytokine storm. That's where these immune system cells are communicating wildly with each other. Mm -hmm. It's so many cells communicating that it causes so much danger for the body. So this is the overzealous. But then 
that's just one part and it's a very small part and the likelihood of that is very small at this point, which is great. But what we want to avoid with COVID-19 especially is the post-COVID syndrome or post-acute sequelae syndrome or what people call long hauler syndrome. Mm -hmm. So what happens with that is that the virus has cleared, but the body continues to attack itself. And it can do this for months and a year so far where people feel shortness of breath. They feel constant fatigue. They feel like they have chronic fatigue syndrome. They have muscle pains. These are the type of things you want to try to avoid. And by keeping your immune system in check and keeping your inflammation down, you'll avoid ending up with long hauler's disease. It almost sounds like it's like having a savings account. You know what I mean? In other words, if you keep your 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 inflammation numbers low, it's like when something happens to you, it's like having savings in the bank. You're going to be better off than um, if you were eating all kinds of foods or experiencing and doing things and your inflammation was higher. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, that, that's one way of looking at it. And it's not a bad way of looking at it. You want it so that the immune system and the inflammation are controlled really well. So the, you want the optimal inflammation and you really want the optimal immune response or you want it to be optimal at baseline so that when you do get sick, you feel a lot fewer symptoms and your body has really less chance of attacking itself. Well, you know, I think this is so amazing. I mean, one of the things that we hear a lot about a plant-based diet is that how healthy it is for you, but you're really talking about a very specific way in which we can sort of control our inflammation or inflammatory factors and not only feel good at the time we're eating because we're eating so healthy, but sort of prevent a response when we do encounter an illness or a challenge. Am I, am I understanding you correctly? Yes, yes. You're bringing down that so that that response isn't overzealous. And so when you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're protecting yourself in some ways and not boosting your immune system. When you hear the term boost the immune system, run the other way. You want to hear the term controlling the immune system. Now, some people use it interchangeably, but you really want them to use it to mean control because boost your immune system to me means raise your white blood cells and you don't want to make them higher unless you've been immunosuppressed, but you want to make them control. And that is really the important factor here. And that's where fiber comes into play and that's where a whole food plant-based diet comes into play. And that's where prevention comes into play. And that's where reversal comes into play of reversing diseases. Yeah, it almost seems to me, if I can, if I recall correctly, that um, people who were immune compromised in COVID sort of did better in some cases than people that um, weren't. And does it explain that because their immune system was lower, and when they had that inflammatory response, then um, they were it didn't go as high. Well, I can't, there's not been really any definitive on that. So I can't answer that question. Um, there's not necessarily research that says that that's the case. It's an interesting theory and you would think that that might be better because people thought that being immunocompromised might be a difficult part, but it may be, there may be a, a bad side of being immunocompromised with drugs which means that your immune response isn't strong enough. So you've got to be very careful to balance this out. It's very precarious. So if you don't have a strong enough immune response, then you might be in big trouble and get more opportunistic infections where people who went into the hospital and had severe COVID, what they ended up with, some of them were severe, or even some people who weren't hospitalized but went to the hospital, ended up with severe pneumonia. And that comes because your immune system can get suppressed, in fact. And so wow. you can get double pneumonia and it opens it up to um, opportunistic infections like pneumonia. So inflammation is a response of the body to fight. Um, foreign substances. You foreign can say substances. bacteria, you can say an injury, you can say but what it, it deems harmful, to harmful substances, I shouldn't say foreign, but harmful substances. Harmful can be stress. And stress 
emotional or physical, you're not bringing in any substance. You already have the substance, but by your cortisol levels, your hormone levels and your adrenal gland going so high, it causes problems and breakdown and inflammation. So it can be anything that's harmful to the body or that the body perceives is harmful. And that's a very important point because in autoimmune disease, the body attacks its own tissue and it perceives that there's a harm when there isn't. Right, and I was thinking about the stress that we've all been under. I know that the brain doesn't like uns uncertainty and we certainly have been under a lot of uncertainty and that in a way is kind of a chronic stress. Correct, so correct. is are we all a certain to a certain extent more inflamed than we would be normally just because we're in a pandemic? Well, then, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, and then would, you know, like healthy habits even make more sense now or be more crucial than ever? I would absolutely agree with that statement. We're in a constant sense of stress. Some people are more relaxed than other people, but it's a very difficult situation to deal with because you're not free to move around and it's much different. And so, yes, it does create a lot more stress. And I've seen with several patients that a handful of my patients have broken out with um, shingles. And that is from the stress, either physical or mental stress. So one of the things that I'm suggesting to people is that if you're over the age of 50, get the shingles vaccine because stress, whether it's physical or mental, can play a role in causing um, shingles. I never thought it could, but in this situation, it's such high stress. Wow, well, that's really great advice. And how is uh, inflammation beneficial to us? Well, I guess if we have these foreign substances, then it's gonna help us ward off that, right? Correct, correct. Well, okay. we need inflammation to fight infection. We need inflammation to repair injury. We need inflammation for the short term. And short-term inflammation, when there's a problem, when there's a harm, when there's a foreign substance that's invading us, we need it to fight off. If we don't have the ability to do that, then we get opportunistic infections and die. That's why people, people don't die of pneumonia. They die because their immune system is crashing and they get a pneumonia that exacerbates or catalyzes or swiftens the death. Wow. So it seems to me like what you're saying too is if we eat a plant-based diet or have these healthy habits, that this idea of having short-term inflammation, if we're, if we're not you know, using common sense and, and eating well and exercising, that's my, my neck of the woods, right? But I, I teach people how to do, then we're kind of causing long-term inflammation, are we? That's correct. We can cause long-term inflammation and chronic inflammation is where the body starts to break down. And the problem with it is, it would be great if the inflammation shot through the roof and you felt it and you went, oh my God, I have chronic inflammation. Right. But the most dangerous type of inflammation is chronic inflammation that's smoldering. That's just above where it should be, where it's outside. So there's, there's a factor that we can use to measure it in the blood. One factor, there's a m m many of them, but the most well, studied factor is called C-reactive protein. And we just had a question in the chat about that. My doctor keeps talking about CRP. So I okay. love that you're, you're talking about so this. C-reactive protein. And what you want to specifically measure, and I don't mean to make this a little bit more confusing because there's three different types of C-reactive protein, but you don't have to remember anything but one, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So when you think about it, you want the thing that's going to pick up the most. So you want the thing that's most sensitive. So high sensitivity. So I try to be very empathetic with my patients. I'm highly sensitive. So think about high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Okay. So normal C-reactive protein, and when I'm going to use a term that's negative, is average. Because nobody wants to be average. Once I was average, I wanted to get the hell out of, sorry for using that, but I wanted to get out of the average zone. I wanted to be optimal. I wanted to be better than average. Yeah. So in high sensitivity CRP, when it's a high, it's above three. When it's average, it's one to three. And when it's optimal, it's less than one. 
And not only can you get it optimal, but you can potentially, I've gotten several, actually many of my patients to undetectable inflammation. In other words, less than 0 0.3 or 0 0.1 depends on which lab does it. But so you want to shoot for the best possible inflammation where you're either optimal or undetectable. And that means that your inflammation is much better. There's no smoldering. But if you have a situation where your high sensitivity C-reactive protein is above three, 3.5, four, 4.5, five, and it's just sitting there years after years, it's gonna start causing problems. And are the problems it's causing chronic disease such as obesity, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and autoimmune conditions, or are those actually related to inflammation? Yes, all of those are related to inflammation. Basically 80 plus percent of chronic diseases are related to inflammation whether they're autoimmune, whether they're diabetes, whether they're heart disease, whether it's cholesterol, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's arthritis, whether it's neurodegenerative diseases like macular degeneration, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and um, these things are all related. So autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and cirrhotic arthritis or uh, um, cirrhosis. I, I mean, those are all re related. Um, psoriasis is related, sorry, cirrhosis is related as well. Cirrhosis is of the liver, but psoriasis is, um, and cirrhotic arthritis are basically the same thing, but one demonstrates with arthritis as well, or joint pain. And then cirrhosis is where you have inflammation in the liver, where you start out with hepatitis potentially, or non-alcoholic fatty liver, and then you develop um, uh, cirrhosis and you develop potentially hepatic carcinoma, which means you end up with cancer in the liver. So all of these things are all based on inflammation. And things like gout are based on inflammation where you have inflammatory arthritis. Anything that's inflammatory with the arthritis, and there's so many of them, are based on inflammation. Even osteoarthritis, which is just plain arthritis, but that's not systemic, that's localized. So you have pain in certain joints, but it can drive you crazy, like your hips or knee pain. Mm -hmm. Or hands, right? Or hand, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So C high sensitive CRP? Is CRP, that high sensitivity CRP. High sensitive. Okay. Um, is there a way to measure like the average American's uh, high sensitivity or CRP high sensitivity. Do we, we, do we know anything about like where we, we stand, especially with the SAD diet, the standard American diet? Sure, we can measure it in the blood and it's very easy to measure in the blood. Any major lab can measure it. Any um, major lab that's around will measure it and it's standardized. So that's great. So you can go to any lab and they'll measure high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And they'll be able to tell you whether you have inflammation or you have average inflammation or you have optimal inflammation. And you don't wanna stand for average inflammation, you want optimal inflammation because again, average inflammation means you get average diseases as you age. Right, right. So I guess my question is, like what if I'm the average Joe and I'm, I'm, um, I'm eating the standard American diet, I've never really heard of inflammation, I'm, I'm listening to this for the first time, like what are my chances of my numbers being, right, if, I, if I've not really paid much attention to my diet or, I kind of exercise a lot, but you know. Yeah, well then you're talking um, about two things that come into effect. You're talking about age, because with the standard American diet, the more abuse to the body, the worse it gets. So it's really not about when I get older, I get all these diseases. It's about how long you abuse your body. So if you take somebody who's um, say an alcoholic and they're an alcoholic for a year and then they get off alcohol, their effect on their body is probably gonna be minimal. But if you've been abusing your body for 20 or 30 years, you're more likely to have significant problems after that. So it's about how many years you've been affecting it. So as you age, your CRP is more likely to go up just because you're doing the standard American diet and you're abusing your body with processed foods and meats and salts and sugars and all these things that we wanna to try to reduce to a certain extent. Wow, so you're essentially saying that we can be sort of abusing our bo bodies with our diet. 
Right. You can be abusing your bodies with your diet for years, but luckily there's redemption. <laughs> which is what I wanted to ask about, which is how does fiber prevent inflammation? Why is it key to optimizing our health and longevity? Okay, so fiber, what's really interesting about fiber is that um, we can't, there's, to, fi to us, fiber is indigestible. It creates no calories. There are no calories to it. We can't digest fiber. There's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. But soluble fiber means, oh, it um, dissolves in water and insoluble fiber means it doesn't. And if that means anything to anybody, great, but it doesn't mean anything to me. However, soluble fiber to bacteria that are in your gut, in your microbiome, in your intestines, that means something to them. The soluble fiber can be broken down by those microbiome. There are hundreds of species in your gut and there are billions breaking them down. And what they do is they break down the soluble fiber into waste. And when they make that waste, that waste is called short chain fatty acids. And that waste is what we use for fuel. So we take the short chain fatty acids and our um, inner lining, which is the mucosal lining, absorbs those short chain fatty acids and we get more energy. But we don't only have an energy, but we also have a relationship where the bacteria, the microbiome communicates with that mucosal layer. And what it does is it tells the mucosal layer with chemical relationship between the bacteria and the mucosa, it tells them to produce more cells and to produce enough Muco mucus so that the bacteria doesn't touch the wall of the intestine. And if it touches the wall or thins out, you have more probability of inflammation. And so that mucosa, it's a very precarious relationship where the bacteria sit on the mucus layer. They do not touch the wall of the intestines. And the thinner the mucosa, the thinner the mucus layer, I'm sorry, the thinner the mucus layer, the more likely it is to touch that wall. So when you have less fiber, you have thinner mucus layer and you're more likely to have inflammation and problems. But when you have a natural more thickness to the mucus because you have more fiber to have those bacteria, those good bacteria digesting the fiber, you do much better and you avoid that inflammation. And in fact, when those short chain fatty acids come in and they get through the wall and they can help also with many different things, they can help reduce cholesterol by bringing, stopping the synthesis of cholesterol and also bringing bile acids into the gut. And when you bring bile acids into the gut, those bile acids can bind with carcinogens which means that actually the uh, bacteria that digest the soluble fiber actually help detoxify our bodies to some extent. Wow. And so then there's one more side, and I'm, I'm sorry. For no, me, no, keep going. But, but the other piece is so, insoluble fiber. And insoluble fiber means basically it's creating a river or bulk in your stool so that things keep moving. And when things keep moving, we don't get constipated. And we're not talking about constipated personality here. We're talking about constipated gut. So when things keep moving, it's very important. And it also, with the carcinogens, doesn't allow the carcinogens to get close to the wall because when the river continues to move, it gets um, uh, brought along and then excreted. So these are really important things. And these come from the fiber that we eat. So the more fiber we eat, the better off we are. And we want a combination of soluble and insoluble fibers. Wow. It's almost like you're saying that like the, the intestinal wall gets coated with this amazing protective um, from fiber, you know, coating right. in a way. Protective cells, mucus that breaks down. It's almost like a slime. Let's call it slime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Slime is good or for some you. Some people call it a gel, you okay. know, whatever you want to call it. Yes, and, and I guess um, processed foods are responsible for diminished fiber content in the American diet, aren't they? 
Well, so, because processed foods have been stripped of their fiber. Processed foods have been stripped not only of their fiber, but they've had sugar added to it and they've had other things added to it. They've had salt to it and all these different things that, and they've had fat added to it. And when you have that thicker mucus layer, that helps with chronic diseases. Yeah. And when you have that processed food, that worsens it and that increases the fat on your body when you don't have the thickened mucus layer, the ideal level, and that gets rid of some of the fat when you do. Yeah, this is really, this is really helpful, I think, in clearing up a lot of um, some of the, the, the questions that people have of like why fiber works and, and what the microbiome does and you know, how it prevents leaky gut, for example. Right, it tightens up the junction so that you don't get the leaky gut, and that's really important or intestinal uh, permeability. If you want to look up leaky gut and you want to look up research on it, look up intestinal um, permeability rather than looking up um, leaky gut because the research, there's no research in medicine under leaky gut. That's a catchphrase used in the layman term. But look up intestinal permeability and you'll find a lot more data on that. So here's a question. Can people get enough fiber from diets without processed food, regardless of whether they're plant dominant, like you know, if they were on paleo or Whole30 or keto diets? That's a really good question. Right now, we are so deficient, the average American, and I hate to use the term average American because nobody wants to be average. Let me go back right. to that. But the average American has about 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day. And the American Heart Association and the American Dietetic Association, and I'm not making fun of them, recommend 25 grams for women and 38 grams for men. Now that's wonderful. So women should stay constipated. No, you should really shoot for 40 grams of fiber, regardless of who you are, a minimum of 40 grams of fiber, and you do much better. And the problem is that um, Whole30 and Paleo, unless you're doing a ton of um, plants, you're going to have a problem because it uses a lot of um, meats. And meat, as we know, has 0, 0.0 fiber. So when you think about also about protein, people ask me all the time about where do I get my protein? And I usually have a, I have a shirt that says, don't ask me about my protein and I won't ask you about your cholesterol. So that's to give you a perspective on how that goes. All protein comes from plants. All protein comes from plants. So let me repeat that. So that we get protein, enough protein, and it's tons of it, and that's where it comes from. You, when you think about um, an elephant, there are 14,000 pound elephants. Those are the biggest, so I wouldn't say all of them are. But they get it all from plants. When you think of a gorilla, they get it all from plants. The idea is to follow the fiber and the fiber has protein. So don't follow the path of protein, follow the path of fiber. And that way you get the most fiber possible. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about combining plants so that you get whole proteins or is that even uh, the way it's done these days? Has that been debunked? That has been debunked luckily. You do not have to combine proteins just by eating a whole food plant-based diet, just by eating beans, legumes. The best food, by the way, in terms, of, um, in terms of fiber are beans and legumes. They have basically a split between soluble and insoluble fibers, and they have the most protein. They have about seven, eight grams per half cup serving, which is really nice. But even better than that now is we have something called bean pasta and bean spaghettis, where they have all these different brands and they come in 11 to 13 grams of fiber. And the amount of protein in those have 21 to 27 grams of protein in a serving. And so that's really tremendous. And so you can get a ton from beans and beans are really a wonderful source. And so they give you a lot of fiber, they give you a lot of protein and they give you a little bit of fat, not a lot. But then um, the next level are whole grains. But when you think of whole grains, you think, oh, well, no, I'm not going to have the white bread. I'm going to have the wheat bread. Wheat bread is brown bread. Brown bread and white bread 
are just cousins to each other. And there's no difference in terms of fiber level. When you look at bread, you really want whole grain bread, but it's really hard to get that much fiber from bread. When you look for a bread that has three grams of fiber, you can drop it on the, your foot and probably break your toes. It's that heavy, that thick. So you wanna be really careful. Where you really wanna get the fiber from grains are things like oatmeal, intact grains, millet, farro, quinoa. Those things have a lot more grains to them. They have five grams of grains. They have six grams of grains. They're much better than um, something that's been pulverized. And then as we go down the list, um, nuts are a really good source of fiber. But do you know the problem with nuts? Is it the fatty content? Correct. Eating too much nuts makes a big difference and raises your cholesterol to a certain extent. But if you don't eat too much nuts, which is about one to two ounces, or basically an eighth to a quarter cup, you can measure it, put it in a Ziploc bag, I tell my patients, and then you have the nuts for the day, and then don't go beyond that. Don't go nutty. Um, sorry, I had to say that. Um, <laughs> but basically, then you only get basically three or four grams of um, fiber from them. Um, but then the next is really dark leafy greens. And dark leafy greens have probably about three to five grams of fiber, three to four grams of fiber. But the wonderful thing about dark leafy greens is that, and this is what we found in our research, is that dark leafy greens have a lot of phytonutrients, phytochemicals. There are 25,000 phytochemicals. There are families called carotenoids. And maybe you've heard of um, uh, carotenoids or bioflavonoids or polyphenols um, or um, plant sterols or these are the type of different groups that are involved. And what they do is they help with nutrients. They help raise the nutrients so you reduce the inflammation. And they may have more impact on inflammation than even fiber itself. But in combination, wow. it's wonderful. And so what we saw in our research is that the HSCRP that we mentioned went down tremendously when we gave them specifically focusing on dark green leafy vegetables. And that played a huge role. And, and also fruits like uh, fruits like blueberries that have a lot of anthocyanins, the blue purple color. Sort of gives you the reason why they say eat the rainbow. Right, eat the rainbow, very important, eat the rainbow. And the darker the color, the better. So it, it's wonderful in that way. Mm -hmm. And then when you get down to fruit, fruit has a little less fiber, but it's still a wonderful thing. And it's still a wonderful thing to eat. But don't be um, surprised at the fact that actually raspberries have a tremendous amount of fiber. Raspberries, a cup of raspberries is eight grams of fiber. Wow. So what you want to do is you want to try to focus on the fact that you want to eat basically foods that have fiber. Everything you put in your mouth, you want to say, does it have fiber? It doesn't have to have a huge amount, but if everything you eat has fiber, you're going to do really well. And in fact, there was a video that I was watching the other day by Michael Greger, and he said uh, in the paleo age, they were eating um, as much as 104 grams of fiber a day. So you that's, could be eating, we, we don't even get close to that. Well, that's such a perfect question because somebody asked in the chat, um, how much fiber is too much fiber on a 3000 calorie whole food plant-based diet? I'm getting between 100 grams and 150 grams of fiber. Is that okay? If you're getting between 100 and 150 grams of fiber, you have to be doing tremendous amount of whole food plant-based. You should calculate it out. And if you're getting that much, congratulations. But it's really <laughs> hard to get that much. And be careful because you don't want functional fiber. Functional fiber means it comes from, for instance, psyllium husk, where you have it from Metamucil. Or you get it from Fiber One where you look at fiber one and they have 20 grams of fiber in their uh, bread or in their yogurt or in their, um, um, in their brownies. And you're like, wait, how can they have 20 grams? Because they use things like inul inulin where they add the fiber to it. It's functional fiber. It's not the same effect. Unfortunately, I wish you could take a pill and say, okay, I take this pill. I have enough fiber for the day. I'm done. Yeah. Um, 100 to 150, according to the chromometer, Chromometer, chromometer. Have you heard of this? C R O N O M E T E R. 
chronometer? No. Okay. But you can measure, you can look at everything you eat and see how much fiber you're getting by serving size and everything else. And you can calculate it out. So I've calculated out and I give certain amounts to patients. I've figured out certain ways to make sure you're getting enough fiber and it's super simple. Yeah, you know, speaking of simple, I'd love to talk to you for you to talk about just hydration and the foods and the fiber and water and why like fiber supplements, uh, can you like Metamucil are not the same things as plant foods. You started to talk a little bit more about that, but the importance of hydration, especially if you're eating a high fiber diet or a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah, hydration is very important. And hydration can come from water, which is good, but it's not great because we're not made of water. So in other words, we don't go, if, if we ever had to go to a hospital and we get IV fluids, we don't give them water because that would reduce our electrolytes. That would reduce our vitamins and minerals. So we don't wanna overdo it with water. So if you're thirsty and you drink a bottle of water and then you think, well, I'm gonna hydrate myself. So I'm gonna drink another bottle of water. You're gonna be hydrating yourself into the bathroom for the next hour in and out, in and out probably 10 times because the body wants to get rid of that excess water. Where you really wanna get fluids is from foods that contain fluids. So you want to eat them from fruits and vegetables. That's where they have a lot of fluid and that's where you get the best hydration and you get some fiber from it. Foods that um, give you fluid. So I was watching the animal planet one day and I saw these desert lizards and they put them in an aquarium with sand and the desert lizards don't have water, access to water, but they put down um, romaine lettuce they used. And they showed how they ate the romaine lettuce. And this is how they exist on the fluids from the greens and from the fruits, but in this case, from the greens. And the wonderful thing is they're probably doing much better than we are. And you think to yourself, but I wouldn't have water. Yes, but you'd have fluids. And so fluids are really what we want. And water isn't bad, but fluids from fruits and vegetables are even better for hydration purposes. Why doesn't um, why doesn't fiber that's from functional fiber like uh, Metamucil and stuff like that, why doesn't it work as well? I don't know. I think it's the fact that it's been processed and pulverized. It's kind of like taking um, wheat flour and pulverizing it, you know, taking kernels and pulverizing it to become wheat flour, taking oats and pulverizing it. And that's what may happen. But then a follow-up question to this, and I don't mean to create my own question, but it's okay. then why could you say that bean pastas are okay? Because they're pulverized beans, mm. right? Wouldn't you say that then pulverized beans wouldn't have much fiber because they'd right. be broken up? Right. Well, the fact is that certain foods act differently. When you take whole grains and you pulverize them, they lose their fiber content from being as useful. But when you take beans and you pulverize them, they just still remain intact. They seem to work really well, whether they're pulverized or not. And in fact, when they're pulverized, they do even better. Wow. And That's we don't cool. know exactly why that is, but they do better. So certain foods that are pulverized actually do better and whole grains that are pulverized do worse. Yeah, we've had some questions about uh, Crohn's disease and um, fiber that might be a little rough for, for people, like if they can't eat that much fiber. What do you recommend in that situation to, to tone down inflammation? Sure. Crohn's disease is something that affects basically one... Uh, oh, Crohn's disease. I'm sorry. Crohn's disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease. Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And Crohn's is um, a situation... And, and it's a very good question. I actually had a patient. I'll just give you a short anecdotal story. Sure. I had a patient who had Crohn's disease for 14 years. And she was on an immunosuppressive. And I won't mention the name. It's called Remicade, but I didn't mention the name. <laughs> we'll just call it Remicade because that's its name. Um, so using an immunosuppressive called Remicade. And she was on it for 14 years. And um, her physician, a GI doctor, said, you know, she was worried about infection. And he told her, don't worry about infection. It's overblown. You'll not have a problem with it. Don't worry. Well, 14 years into it, she got severe pneumonia mm -hmm. for three weeks. 
and she's 46 years old. And she decided, I'm calling David. I'm going to call me. I'm going to call because I can't do this anymore. I can't do the medication anymore. I need to try to change my lifestyle. So she comes to me and she says, but I've got to warn you. My husband says that I have the best plant-based diet that you can possibly have. But her CRP, her HSCRP is 6.4. Remember, above three is high. Above one is average. She follows what we talk about and she gets off, um, she gets the CRP to go from 6.4 to 0 0.4 wow. in three months. And then her GI doc agrees to take her off that medication. We can always put her back but take her off the medication. So she's been off that medication now two plus years and she's really thankful because COVID came off and she would have been on the immunosuppressive. And this one had caused pneumonia. So this was a great story and she's now been off that medication. So when it comes to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, what you do with uh, fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables, when you start, you cook them, you cook them. You may chop them up, chopping them up is a great way, but you cook them. You don't eat raw vegetables right away because that'll wreak havoc on your system. That'll make it much worse. So make sure you cut the vegetable. I uh, mean, make sure you, well, cutting the vegetables releases nutrients, but make sure you steam them. Steaming them is the best process for most mild on your system. Make sure you steam them well, make sure you cook them. Make sure when you use fruit, like an apple, you peel the skin. Make sure you don't have fruits that have um, skin, like a thick skin around them. So you're not eating cherries. Because if you can tolerate cherries, great, but that can set off the worsening of the problem. And so you want to, and then what I tell people is you want to do a smoothie. And a smoothie, I have a specific smoothie that I give a lot of people because it gives you a lot of fiber, it gives you a lot of protein, but it has a very mild effect. And people with IBD can tolerate this uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and it's raw, but it's pulverized in a blender. So it's still useful. So you're not getting rid of it. So you're not juicing. Juicing's great to get a lot of nutrients and reduce inflammation, but you strip it of the fiber and the protein. So you're stripping it of some benefit. So you want to be very careful. And when it comes to beans, you want to do beans, but you might want to even start with the bean pasta over the beans. Or if you start with the beans, start slow, and, you know, start low and go slow. Start with half a cup, go for a week or two and see how you do, and then increase it uh, gradually. But the thing with beans, when everybody says the more beans, beans, good for the heart, the more you eat, the more you eat, have gas. <laughs> um, but you know, when you have that situation, it's about going too fast and your system doesn't catch up. You need the microbiome to catch up. You're changing the microbiome and think of the microbiome as the rainforest. You're growing the rainforest. You're creating diversity. And so you need time to catch up for that. Beautiful. Can you talk a address about, um, what's accurate about diverticulitis and fiber and the myth of avoiding nuts and seeds? Okay, sure. Um, you don't mean diverticulitis, you mean diverticula. Yeah. Um, and Thank I you. only say diverticula. Um, I only say, Wendy, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say the question was about diverticulitis. Oh, and okay. Okay. About diverticulitis. Okay, so diverticulitis is a tricky thing because if you have diverticulitis, you should be treated, a lot of times with diverticulitis, you should be very careful because you should treat it with antibiotics if it's because it has the potential to perforate. So you want to be very careful with diverticulitis. So you want to get over that little diverticulitis episode with uh, uh, antibiotics. And so you want to be very careful. And, um, and you can have fiber at the time, but you want to make sure just like with inflammatory bowel disease, you want to have cooked greens and cooked vegetables and very soft and very broken down. You can even have bean pasta because it's already pulverized, but you want to be very careful while you're having the diverticulitis 
episode, not to inflame it even more with raw materials. And then, um, and then, and you go on things like flagell, and that's how they treat it with antibiotics. But at the same time, you want to get the nutrients up at the same time, and that's great. And you also want to take a probiotic because the antibiotic, you need probiotics two hours afterwards. Um, so, but in terms of nuts and seeds, nuts and seeds don't cause diverticula or diverticulitis. Diverticula and diverticulitis. Diverticula is the outpocketing. Diverticulitis is when it gets inflamed. And they don't cause it. And the research keeps showing over and over and over again that nuts and seeds do not cause it. They happen to be there sometimes when it's in the outpocketing in your intestine. They show up and they say, oh, well, it must be the nuts and seeds that caused that outpocketing. No, they just get stuck there. And they might be get stuck there because the slime gets so the river's moving along and all of a sudden you have a delta or a, you know, a little offshoot and that seed gets stuck in that area. So it's not that the seed or nut actually causes any problem, doesn't cause the inflammation, doesn't cause it to get worse. In fact, the more fiber you have, the more you're likely to repair diverticula. And the more you're able to bring down diverticulitis, we bring down the itis. The itis is inflammation. It means either infection or inflammation. So if you have the nuts and seeds, you'll bring it down. So you can do small amounts and it's fine. But seeds are the best when you have diverticulitis, just to be careful, but don't overdo it when you have diverticulitis because you want to be careful of raw, period. Yeah. You want to be basically eating a lot of steamed, mushy, or pulverized into, um, uh, um, into a smoothie or into a soup. Think baby food. <laughs> exactly. That's what I say. Think baby food. But I'm afraid to say that because then I'm afraid people are going to go, ooh. But, you know, we, our body loves pulverized foods. It does, right? It um, loves you, pulverized. It does. Yeah. Let's let's talk before we end, you know, let's talk for a second, just for, for all of us, like what is an optimal day's intake of fiber and water? In other words, what's the best anti-inflammatory diet? You know, like options for breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, snacks, like just sort of break it down for us a little bit. So if, if there's someone here who's on the standard American diet and they're hearing this for the first time, they're like, well, what am I supposed to eat? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And so here's the thing. Here's, here's the answer to that question. I'm going to answer it with the optimal, but I'm also going to say, please don't think you have to go from zero to 60. In other words, if you haven't been doing a whole food plant-based diet and all of a sudden I give you all the optimal and I say, okay, this is what you're going to do. This is, you're going to go from zero to 60 and you're going to be overwhelmed. And then you're going to have gas and bloating because you have too much fiber all at once. You don't want that. So, you want to start slowly if you do, and then gradually build up because for a week or two, if you really go from zero to 60, you're going to be like a Studebaker. You're going to be backfiring and it's going to hurt. Oh. I mean, it's not, it's not the embarrassment part that I care about. I'm 50 plus. I don't care. But as a person outside in society, I don't care as a doctor, period, but because that's a healthy thing. Gas is a healthy thing. So, you know, gas is not an unhealthy thing. It's just swamp gas that's an unhealthy thing. The swamp gas that when you're within a 30 mile radius, you knock out everybody around you. Unless of course you wanna use something and you're in line, that's great. But anyway, barring that. Um, so the optimal way of doing this is for breakfast. You could have something like oatmeal with berries and banana. You could have, um, a tofu scramble. Mm. You could have a tofu scramble because tofu has our beans. Their be tofu, tofu is be tofu are or tofu is. <laughs> so tofu is, is tofu is beans. I okay, don't know. Tofu is thanks. Um, Wendy, you could have helped me out with the plural. <laughs> of the um, She's our writer. Tofu, you're right. Well, tofu. Anyway, they have plenty. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so tofu um, is a great source of fiber and it's a bean. And so you could have a tofu scramble. Um, and what I do is like use spinach and onions and saute the onions in water. And you don't really want to use a ton of oil because oil is just like juice. Oil is you take away the product of the olive and you just take the oil and it goes right to your hips. 
So there's, it doesn't take any, any energy to absorb the fat from that. Mm -hmm. So you want a less oil, so you could use like a Pam olives, uh, olive oil spray and you squeeze it. And I always t say, be gentle with Pam because she was my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> so when you squeeze her, think of me fondly. Oh, um, but, so anyway. But I'm um, Right, <laughs> sorry. You know, I get a little goofy. Um, yes, all right. But when you spray it on, you do a very thin layer if you want to, but water sauteing is even better. And you can do onions and mushrooms and spinach, and then you saute it and you get it really nicely done. And then you can put in the tofu at the end and you get firm tofu and you break it up into crumbles. And it really makes a nice, um, almost like an egg white omelet, but you're not using egg whites, you're using tofu because there's no fiber in egg whites. Mm -hmm. So you make it with a crumble and then I crack pepper on, fresh pepper from a mill, or you can use Tabasco, or you can use Cholula, or you can use Sriracha. Be careful of Frank's because it has too much salt. But though that level up to 80 milligrams is okay. Um, and so it makes it really flavorful, or you could put on um, any kind of flavoring you want with that. And then um, you could also have fruit for breakfast. So, I mean, you can do a number of different things. And the other thing I like to say is I like people to have a smoothie. Now, smoothie for me is a 32 ounce smoothie and I can always um, uh, give you the recipe and you can always share it. But Wonderful. Well, if you, if you give it to me, we will, with the recording, yeah. we will send it out. Absolutely. Okay, so, so when I do a smoothie, I do a smoothie in a, Vitamix or a Ninja. You need a high power blender. I have a Vitamix, much more expensive than a Ninja, but my Vitamix has been around for 15 years since the whole time I've been using it. And I use it more than I use an oven. So in a smoothie goes one cup of water, one cup of unsweetened vanilla soy milk uh, from Silk or um, one cup of almond milk, either way. And then um, 16 ounces, one pound of dark leafy greens. It can be spinach. It can be spinach with bok choy. I love baby bok choy. It can be baby kale. Um, it could be romaine. It's fine. Any dark leafy green. And then, but if you have, um, well, we can go on to that later. That's a whole different discussion about oxalates with, um, osteoporosis and, uh, kidney stones. But People with kidney stones, unless they're super absorbers, are not going to have a problem with this, whether they use spinach or they don't. So you use one pound of dark leafy greens, 16 ounces, and you put in one banana, and you put in two tablespoons of flaxseed, and you put in two tablespoons of cocoa powder, unsweetened, and you store the flaxseed in the freezer. It's better. Some people say refrigerator, but it lasts even longer in the freezer. And then you blend it, and then you add four and a half cups of frozen blueberries. Yes, I said, I think I said four and a half cups. Oh my goodness, this sounds one, gigantic. I didn't, I didn't say three, I said four and a half cups of blueberries. But you blend it after you put all the stuff in and you make it liquid. And then you blend it and it makes a really nice smooth um, uh, smoothie. And if it's chunky or if it's too thick, it's not called a chunky, it's called a smoothie. So you need to blend it a little bit more. So that's how, it works, but that gives you in that smoothie is about 27, 28 grams of fiber right there. Wow. And it's easy to absorb because it's pulverized. And then there's about 27 to 30 grams of protein. So it's a really nice thing and it lowers inflammation. And how and many then, tablespoons of the cocoa powder? Two. Two. Okay. And then if you want, you could put in uh, two tablespoons of PV2 pure peanut powder, which adds a little bit more flavor. And that has some protein, um, about six grams of protein, and it has uh, one gram of fiber. So you're really not getting a lot of fiber. You're getting one, and you're splitting it into two. So you're having 32 ounces. This is making 64, you're having 32. I gave you the recipe for 64 ounces okay. for two servings. You could put the second serving in the refrigerator, take a spoon, thin it out. Gotcha. Very easy. Then for lunch, you could do a salad and you could use any greens. You could use romaine, arugula. I love mosh, and mosh you can find from Organic Girl. Look it up, mosh, M-A-C-H-E. Um, and it comes from France. We actually had it in Italy, and it was absolutely wonderful, and it goes by 32 different names, wild. 
Um, but you can have any green you want. Then you could put beans on top. You could put fruit on top. You could put salsa. You could put hummus. Um, if you have nuts left over, you could drizzle it on top. And then you could use um, different flavored balsamic vinegars. Um, you could use Annie's light dressing. Um, you could use uh, Joe's uh, ginger, carrot ginger dressing, the one you get from the Japanese restaurant that's really good, that's orange, that everybody wants more, and they charge you an extra dollar for. Um, you could have that as well. Um, or you could um, make a soup, um, and you can make your own soup from scratch using um, things like, actually, you could use tomatoes as a base, you could use POMI, P-O-M-I, you get it in a box, and it has no salt added, and then you can um, add greens to it and you can add herbs and you can add um, you can add spices like cayenne or paprika and you can add mushrooms onions and garlic and you can add lots of greens and it makes it really flavorful you could use water as a base you could use um, uh, low sodium vegetable broth as a base you could even use um, carrot juice as a base but just be careful to make sure that that doesn't have an effect on your um, sugars. You don't want it to go up based on carrot juice and probably won't raise it if it has no salt added and it's really fresh, but it might. So just be careful with that. Um, so you could have soup. You could also have beans. You could have a bean pasta. And the type of bean pasta you want to have is um, the bean pastas are like this example, tolerance. Um, and um, this is where it comes in, where you get that 11 to 13 grams. And no, I don't sell any of this, and I have nothing to do with any part of this. This is David. Are we near your kitchen? Can you we just you can just show us all these things that you're making? Um, yes, we're right near my kitchen. Um, and, I love it. Um, and then um, you can have fruit in between for snacks. You can have oranges. You can have navel oranges. You can have bananas. How many bananas can you have? Well, I took a diabetes patient, and they had PTSD after 9/11 and they were eating five bananas a day, and they were a diabetes patient, like I said. And they asked me, could I have 10 bananas a day? And I said, I don't know, why don't you do it for a month? So they did it for a month, and their sugar went up um, by half a percent on the A1C, which means they had to cut back the bananas. So the, um, to make the story short, it's basically don't have more than five or six bananas, especially if you're a diabetes patient, but you can have as much as five or six bananas. And if you're eating more than five or six bananas, I don't know, that's incredible. <laughs> I couldn't do that again. And, I've and what, done that once. Right. Um, so then you can have bananas. And then for dinner, you can have steamed, roasted, sauteed vegetables. And you could put it over quinoa, brown rice, wild rice. You could have... Um, some starchy vegetable if you want, um, like sweet potato or something like that. But just be careful of starchy vegetables if you're overweight and you want to lose weight or if you have diabetes, because those are sugar. Just sweet potato is just as bad as white potato. Um, so you want to be careful of starchy vegetables. Root vegetables are fine if you eat them raw. So if you eat a raw carrot, it's fine. But once you cook it, you turn it into a gremlin and it becomes bad because it raises the sugars. Mm. So you wanna be very careful about that for people who are sensitive to sugars and people who are overweight or obese. Yes, and no. So then you can okay. have fruit and then the last thing you can do is you could take bananas or some fruit and put it in the blender and put in soy milk or almond milk and put in a little bit of nuts and it makes a really nice ice cream. So, um just a quick question. I've been trying to get as many questions as I ask, and, and there's uh, in from the chat. So a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you for that description. I'm, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm hungry. <laughs> After I, all every time that. I describe this, I before COVID, I would have a uh, banana, an apple, or blueberry sitting next to me. Love it. And I love it. I would be picking at it and people would go, you're always eating. And I said, yeah, that's because I'm always talking about the food I love. And, and I initially started out as a bacon lover and in medical school to stay awake, I drank two liter bottles of Coke every day. That's eight glasses of Coke. And I was on double the Zantac of the prescription level. And I said, by 32, I'm gonna have a hole shooting out of my front. And I said, I gotta get off this. And in fact, we went to, Fenway several years ago for my wife's birthday. She's a Boston fan, and I won't talk about that because I'm a Yankee <laughs> fan. I'm a New York fan. 
So, but we went to Fenway and I got a cherry Coke because I wanted to use the 32 ounce souvenir cup for my smoothie because it really is appealing to drink from it. <laughs> and it's wild. Um, and it feels like you're drinking, it could be anything. And um, I, had it filled with cherry coke because I love cherry coke. Who doesn't love cherry coke? And the smell of it was great. And I was about to take a sip and there was ice and I love ice. And I took a sip and I held it in my mouth and I went like this. And my wife said, it's okay, you can spit it out. And I spit it out and she said, give it to the nice lady and ask her if she'll fill it with water and ice. And I said, okay, because it was coated on my tongue. So much sugar, I couldn't stand it. But I thought the smell was like, okay, I want this. But then yes. I realized, you know, so a couple of questions. Sure. Is there an upper limit to too much fiber? I thought you were going to ask me, is there an upper limit to my humor? No, there's no <laughs> upper limit. It's really, is there a lower limit to my humor? It gets worse and worse and worse as time okay. goes on. And in All fact, right. as your health gets better, your humor gets worse because you have time to work on your humor and you don't want to work on your humor. No, we'll just answer the question about fiber then. All right, fine. Is there an upper limit to fiber? No, there's not an upper limit to fiber. But you shouldn't be taking functional fiber. You shouldn't be taking uh, Metamucil or pills to get it up there. You will have so much difficulty to get it beyond a certain point because you know what fiber does? It makes you full. So the more you eat in fiber, the more full you feel. So if you're eating bean pasta, you eat a bowl of bean pasta, you wait about 10 minutes, you try to eat another be bowl of bean pasta. And believe me, I've tried. And I've eaten two and after the second bowl and then 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh my God, I am so full. I'm going to explode. So, I mean, fiber makes you full. That's great. It gives you the word satiety. Full. it also controls your sugars. It controls your insulin spikes and it controls and it, it controls your glucose and it makes insulin more sensitive. So you don't get those insulin spikes. Wonderful. And, um, we have a couple of questions. One, could you just clarify? I, I wanted to really end with, because I think it's important, the individuation of everyone's diet and how important it is to see someone like yourself because people have varying abilities to tolerate fiber and they have allergies to different foods and they have sensitivities and their numbers are different and genetics play a factor. and stress pays the factor and so to have somebody actually looking at that to to say that one diet is good for everyone is is uh you know just not true but can you address for example that and also just remind us dairy inflammatory yes no i'm sorry what was dairy that? dairy inflammatory oh, dairy, dairy. someone had a question about that yeah, yeah, i know the answer but i just wanted to <laughs> So let me, the doctor uh, to be official. Let me answer that question. It varies for everybody. And it is so true. And um, lifestyle is so individualized. And there's a base to it. But don't let anyone tell you that there's one diet, one specific way of doing things. And, you know, if someone came to me and said, I'm not getting off meat, or I'm not going to do that. And I want to be a keto, but I want you to make it plant based keto. And I, I'll say to them, okay, so make it lean meats, make it small amount, try to make it four ounces at each serving. And I'll work with you to make as much greens and beans as I can. But if you're not going to do beans, well, that's okay. We'll work around that. But whatever you'll let us do. So give up the um, fruit, do the beans. If you're really, you know, if you're really solid keto, well, then it's going to be a lot of greens. But I mean, and a lot of vegetables. But, you know, I'll work around the keto. I'll work around the paleo. I'll work around whatever somebody wants, because you don't want to force anybody to do anything. Plus, everybody's body tolerates it differently. That's why when I see a patient, I spend an hour with them at each time. And if I may say what I do the first time and then follow-ups. But is that okay? Okay, so the first appointment, what I do is a very thorough history, physical exam, body impedance scale, which is not just height, weight, body mass index, because we don't really care about height, weight, body mass index. You may care how tall you are because almost everybody comes to me and they say, well, but I was five, six, now I'm five, five. And, you know, nobody seems to say, well, I'm five, five and you made me five, six. That's great. But, you know, hopefully you stay the same height as you thought you were. But that's irrelevant. But the scale is a height, weight, body mass index. But much more importantly, it's fat, fat percent, visceral fat, which is fat around the organs, 
muscle mass, total body water, which is give you sense of dehydration or not. And, um, and these are factors that are very important and that's what we're looking at. And then I write a script for labs and I write a script for labs that's comprehensive, that covers stuff that's specifically for you and other stuff as well so that we have it. But if you have something, I make it specific for you and what you need, but I make a comprehensive so we have an idea of what we're doing. And then we use the labs on the next visit. And each visit is an hour, like I said, in the next visit, we go over the labs and then we go over lifestyle modification. Why do we go over the labs first? Because we want to know what your body needs and what your body doesn't need and what it tolerates and what it doesn't tolerate. And we can pick up a lot of this from all the indications we get. So then we go over the lifestyle modifications, why it's important and what it is specifically for you. And then we go on from there and you get a lot of benefit. But the time goes by so fast. I've had a 10 year old tell me, I said it was an hour and five minutes and the 10 year old said, really? I thought it was five or 10 minutes. <laughs> and I thought a, five, a 10 year old, not to insult, but when I was 10, five or 10 minutes was an hour you know, in, in my world. So anyway, so we, it is very individualized and it doesn't mean you have to do what I just described because what I just described is the base level of, okay, this is what, but one size does not fit all. I hope I made that. Yes, no, you did, absolutely. Clear. And I did have one question and she's asked it several times. So I just wanna- the dairy, so let me cover the dairy. The dairy, and also just really quick, quick mm -hmm. someone said, can you address coffee? And then there's one, thing about S, uh, hang on, B-I-O, one second. And put your Brazil nuts in the uh, freezer. And put your Brazil nuts in the freezer, right? And make sure that they're uh, not unshelled. Right, and then try to crack them. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Uh, what was, what was, was it? I'm still asked? looking for it, but go keep going. You can talk about dairy while I find it. Okay, so let's talk about coffee because coffee is the biggest one. I married a woman who's a coffee drinker. If I told her she couldn't have coffee, I would have the most miserable life and the most miserable wife. So I can't do that. So the interesting thing about coffee is that for every study that has benefits, there's a study that shows detriment. So if you drink coffee, continue, you can continue to drink coffee. But if you don't drink coffee, don't start drinking coffee. Now, what you put in your coffee makes a big difference. So if you're going to Starbucks and getting a latte, mocha, choco, whatever the heck it is, uh, as you can tell, I don't really know the names, but you're putting in whipped cream and you're putting in all this stuff, that's just a dessert that's a thousand calorie disaster. You don't want to put in a lot of sugar. You don't want to put in, um, and if you can, you want to try to use um, a nut milk like uh, or soy milk or almond milk, something like that in your coffee if you don't like it black. But, and I wouldn't go over like three cups of coffee. I mean, when you start getting to four and five, you're starting to get into the jitter zone of what it means. Now, there are some studies that say you do well at five cups of coffee, but the side effects of what happens also says that you can have other issues. Now, when I say a cup of coffee, it's really questionable because cups of coffee come in all different sizes. But I mean, if you're having a decent sized cup, like 12 or 16 ounce cup of coffee, um, even the venti, then if you're having the venti, then, and I know the name, that's pretty good, huh? Um, even though I don't drink coffee. But I'm impressed. If you're venti, then have like two, don't have more than that. Because that's like four cups, that's like more than four cups of coffee. That's a lot. So you can have coffee, just make sure what you put in it is not too much crap. And you don't put in, if you need a spoonful, of sugar, that's okay. You know, one spoonful isn't a big deal. If you can do without it, that's great. If you, but you could use almond milk or soy milk. You know, I'm, 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 I never stop anybody from saying, okay, no. So then, um, does that answer the question with coffee? Yes, that does. And um, they, this is what I found is SIBO, which of course is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And um, I know that um, many docs do not recommend high fiber for this, but plant-based docs usually have a different approach. And is the breath test uh, viable for that? Um, breath test may be viable for that. Yes, there's a breath test. There's two breath tests that you can use that may be viable for it. And um, for SIBO, 
Absolutely, fiber is great. And when they say over, you change the microbiome. You change the microbiome with the right fiber and it plays a role by feeding them, you change it and it helps. And, but I wouldn't be, um, I mean, people even take probiotics with SIBO, but I wouldn't do that. I would do it with the right um, amount of fiber and I would do the fiber gradually. But you know, the interesting thing is that there was a study out recently that showed that we, our microbiome um, compared to everybody else, we used to think it was like 99% the same and 1% we could change maybe a little bit, but it turns out that similarity amongst us is 30%. You can change the microbiome dramatically. And twins, identical twins, monozygotic twins, meaning from one egg, one egg with two fingers, um, one egg um, are only 34% similar in um, their microbiome. So in other words, twins are only twins on the outside. They're not really twins on the inside because you can change so much that goes on with what you do with foods and what you put in your mouth. And that makes a huge difference. So I've, I've had a triplet where one of them is working with me and she's doing really well. A second one is obese. And the third one died of lung cancer. Wow. You, you can see that it has to do with what you put in your body. I so, love that we're getting questions about everyone's vices. What about dark chocolate? What about wine? What about, you know, beer? Um, okay. So what about and I, dairy I, and what about my cheese like someone said oh, you know oh, oh. <laughs> just think all those you know things that you yeah. i was saying biases um what about dark chocolate well if you really like dark chocolate it's fine just make sure just like nuts you keep dark chocolate to a small amount one ounce is a small amount but you're really better off with um uh a couple of squares not um not the whole ounce because if you're going to have nuts, then you're going to have dark chocolate. If you're not overweight and you have no problem with fat, then you can do both and you have no problem with cholesterol. So you need to put in all those factors to say, okay, if I have no problems with those, then I can do dark chocolate and the nuts. And if I'm exercising and if I'm athletic, then go ahead and do the one ounce of dark chocolate and the nuts. That's fine. But you want to be careful. So you want to do a couple squares of dark chocolate or you want to do some dark chocolate and no nuts. You know, dark chocolate's great and it makes you feel better. And if it makes you feel better in this time of COVID, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, I find, I try to go 80 to 85%, somewhere around there, but 70% and higher is fine. Um, I would never take away your dark chocolate. That's just me. Second, wine. I can wine like you can't believe. <laughs> you did not do go there. <laughs> I just did. I just did. Um, but as far as wine goes, you can have wine really you don't want to have it a lot because the studies keep showing any amount of wine can have an impact however if you're eating well and you don't have problems with sugars and your weight's pretty good then i mean having a glass of wine a couple of times a week would be fine um i wouldn't go overboard i you know i would have it like two or three times a week if you wanted two glasses of wine what you can always do is make a wine spritzer and cut the wine in half then you make it into two yeah but and I would then, have two or three times a week. I wouldn't go overboard. I yeah. wouldn't be celebrating at work, which work is at home if you're working from home. And you shouldn't be drinking wine while you're talking on the phone while, or whatever and Zooming. That doesn't count as work. So, yeah. Agreed. And then what about the dairy? What about the dairy? Oh, you want to go to a dairy farmer? Oh, no. <laughs> the dairy. The dairy. Um, you know, we always thought the dairy was such a great thing. And the statement was from the milk company that um, milk, it does, it, you know, it does bone, you know, it helps bones. It gives us strong bones. It gives us a strong body. Well, it actually turns out that dairy, especially milk, plays the opposite role. It actually breaks down the bone and it makes for problems and it creates inflammation. And of the dairy, if there were dairy that I would choose, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that you have to give up your animal protein. That's not my message here. If you don't want to give it up, don't give it up. But it's about reducing it to some degree, potentially, or working around it, whatever you can do. But don't, you don't have to be, when I think of myself as whole food, plant-based, I don't think of myself as vegan. If I were vegan, I would be vegan. 
but I don't think of myself as vegan. Do I eat animal protein? No. But do I think of myself as vegan? No, but that gives me the option if I wanted to, to be able to do it. Now, I don't do it for a number of reasons, ethical and all that comes into effect after health, because now it starts kicking in that whatever. But having said that, you don't have to give up all your animal protein. And that's not the message I'm saying. You want to give up a lot of your processed foods. That's what you want to give up. You want to get more fiber. But if I were going to do a dairy, and I, I bet you didn't know this was going to come from me, I would do potentially yogurt. Because yogurt seems to have the best results of any dairy. And I'm not saying yogurt's great over everything else, but I'm saying yogurt would be the most positive. It has probiotics in it. You don't want flavored yogurt. Oreo in the yogurt doesn't count as yogurt. It counts as processed crop. You really want plain yogurt and you want to add berries to it. Just like if you had oatmeal and you go and you have Quaker oats and you take a packet and it has maple in it and you're like, okay, this is not oatmeal, this is sugar. So if you're gonna have dairy, have it like a parfait and add in um, some, um, yeah. some, and you can add in some uh, oatmeal, you know, rolled oats or something like that. And that'll give you some sense of it. But I don't wanna take away if that's the case. So just, I wanted to give that caveat because I want people to be able to do this. Yeah, you know what? I really appreciate this conversation. I could talk to you forever. Um, I think it's also important. We had uh, is fiber fueled a book that you would recommend by Dr. B. Um, sure. Just be careful because it can o overdo it about fiber fuel, um, and so you want to be careful because some of the recommendations can be a little bit overwhelming. And it's not all about fiber. Like I said, it's about phytonutrients. It's about what we do in general. It's not about trying to stuff in as much fiber as you can, because if that were the case, then we could use functional fiber and raise our levels so much. It's about getting them from plants and making sure that you're digesting them and you're changing your microbiome so you feel better. So I'd be very careful, but yes, you could use it. Just be very careful because some of the recommendations I'm not um, in as much agreement with, but some of them are fine. Great. But that's with most books. Yes, I understand. And you know, the, the one thing- You always ask me questions. And I have a website. Can I, may I give the website? Yes, of course, you know, and we can put it in the chat it's, also so people can reach compass. out to you. The website is medicalcompassmd.com. So medicalcompass, C-O-M-P-A-S-S, M-D is in medicaldoctor.com. And what about plain kefir? Kefir, you can also do kefir and yogurt are sort of on the same level. I see the question. And it's a good question. And I used to do kefir because it had probiotics and stuff like that. So that's a good question. Um, but you can reach me at, um, and my email address, it's a pain in the ass, is <laughs> R as in Dr. Denaif, D-U-N-A-I-E-F, as you can see on the screen, um, at medicalcompassmd.com. Or you can just go on the website and you can always click on info and it'll show you. Or if you look up my name, the website comes right up. So either way, you'll be able to look. And you can see what I've done and you can read some of the stuff I've done. And um, uh, I'm happy to share and everything else. And we want to do a good job. And the idea is to move people to get better and to be able to get off medications and to reverse disease. But most importantly, to feel better. Quality of life is even more important than longevity. And if you're going to live a long life, hopefully it's a fruitful life. And it means that you're going to live a long time without being bound to a bed or a wheelchair or whatever it happens to be if you're not already and not picking on people who are in wheelchairs. That's not what I'm saying because, you know, I come from the fact that I could have been in a wheelchair and that's not what I'm saying. But you don't want to have to be going from one extreme to the next. If you're in a wheelchair, you don't want to have to be bed bound. And if you're in a bed, well, then you're in a bed. Um, <laughs> Dr. Deneo, yeah. I'm going to bring Liana on if she won't, doesn't mind to just to talk a little bit. Let me highlight you. Um, uh, let me add the spotlight. And I want to introduce you because you're just such a phenomenal resource for everyone in person and um, a dear friend. And we've been partners for a, a long time now. And this is this is another way to get support for changing your lifestyle a little bit dramatically, 
addressing chronic uh, illness with whole foods, with plant-based diets, with, you know, by making some of these lifestyle changes. Leanna, do you want to talk a little bit about plant-powered Absolutely. Metro? Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Janeo, thank you so much. You always illuminate everything. So, I mean, you've got the science, you've got the humor, you've got the facts, and you have a lot of the know-how on the lifestyle that's just so practical. So I, I just want to thank you for, for bringing your whole self, as always, into this discussion. And Caroline, for, for being a wonderful partner in um, sharing this with our community. And, and I think the thing I wanna say just to, to take it home, this is what I, I often say at the end is, it's hard to take the next step sometimes. And so if you feel like you want, want help in that, you wanna find community, you wanna be a part of a team of people who are, have been down this road before or who are doing it together, um, please feel free to reach out to us and be a part of our plant powered community, which is really an extension of the JCC community. Um, we've done so many wonderful programs with Caroline and her team over the past two years now. And uh, what we try to do is help you, you know, get really practical. What are you going to do next in your kitchen? What are, what are the recipes you're going to go for? And I'll share um, a link to our new recipe app in the chat box shortly. But I, I just want people to know that sometimes, it's, of course, it's hard to hear that the way that we eat now may not be um, best for dealing with inflammation, may not be best for dealing with day-to-day -day life and the stressors that we have. Um, but there is a way forward. There's a lot of hope. Um, and let's get empowered together. This is all about building a healthier future for all of us. So thank you so much to everybody. And thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much, uh, and again, Leanna. Gra gradual approach is fine. You know, I mean, anything you want to do to get started is a great start. Anything you do to change will make a difference. And that's what you want. Small changes, big results. Thanks, big everybody. But you Thank know, you. A study that showed that just with one smoothie, you got a change in a tremendous change in inflammation without changing the rest of your diet. Yeah, that's right. Eat vegetables for breakfast. That could be one big change. Sure. <laughs> just saying, David. It's a pleasure. We talked about this, I think, in October of uh, 2020. So I'm glad that we finally got a chance to have a conversation in a fireside chat and it just was wonderful. Oh, hey, what's the the two Brazil nuts in the freezer that someone just asked without the shell, right? That's the final? No, two Word. Brazil nuts in the freezer with the shell and then take it out and open the shell <laughs> when you're going to eat it. And good luck with opening that shell because right. if anybody's ever opened a Brazil nut shell, you need a nutcracker and crack it and crack it and crack it and it just doesn't open. And the, those of you that came late, the reason for that is I was asking him about what to do for healthier nails from, you know, hand washing and, and hair and that I had heard that. And he said, oh yes, that'll work. But two in the freezer, make sure they're shelled and then crack them to get there. All right, any final words, David, for us? No, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, like I said, go slowly. You can always go slowly. You can do it immediately, but you can go slowly, even a smoothie a day. What I like to say is a smoothie a day keeps the inflammation away. Well um, done. And that's, that's what I'd like to end on. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you to Wendy Sachs as well for monitoring the chat with Liana and uh, Plant Powered Metro New York. And have a good night, everyone. Please be safe, be well, and we'll see you tomorrow you. if thank you come you. for a brain health. Take care. Thank you so Take much. Bye-bye.